Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, just starting up with this live stream. I'm obviously going to be just like taking questions and comments uh, from everybody watching on YouTube. And this is going to be like colored pencil demoing going on over here. This one was done on a moleskin paper from from one of their one of their sketchbooks. And it was kind of a concept that I had that I was working with that I thought would be really useful and practical, but eventually I discovered that I think their paper for me is not exactly the one that I that I like the most for um, for the kind of drawing that, that I'm doing on it anyway. So that's what this one is, and it's kind of why I'm using it for uh, you know YouTube streams so you guys can see like maybe what the the differences in those those kinds of application are. Um, Really quick, uh, just to say about uh, what's going on this month with Patreon. Atelier Tier is coming back. We got advanced cast drawing. It's going to be really advanced. It's going to be really intense. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to go live on October 1st. So that's going to be another live stream. I'm going to post all the necessary information on Patreon ASAP. So coming up, I'll have the lesson notes coming out, source images coming out. I'll have also a paper prep video coming out so that you know like how to tone your paper or how I tone my paper anyway. So all of that is on the way relatively soon, <laughs> as soon as I can get, uh, get around to doing it. But let me just go ahead and check the comments and make sure that everything is good. Yes, I've got 7th Sun 1 saying we can see you and hear you, <laughs> which <laughs> always sets my mind at ease. Uh, so right. Let's just dive in and see like what's going on. So um, Sopan R says, Hello, Stephen. Do you approach cast and portrait drawing the same way as a barred plate, like keeping the reference side by side and taking measurements or setting up a cast or live drawing from the model? I guess the question is, am I doing the cast drawings from a source image or, or, for, or am I doing the cast drawings from a live image? Uh, in this case, I'm working from the source images that I put out on Patreon, partly because I need to know that there's a continuity issue there, that 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 I know everything about the source imagery and have experienced it. So when I'm giving advices on it, that that everything kind of links up and makes sense. Um, in the past, uh, working from cast has always been like a really really big passion of mine. So uh, I, I've taken a very uh, a very close attention to that. So so working from life with casts. Which, by the way, is also like really possible. It's not actually so difficult to kind of get a hold of them. Between uh, there's a cast producer in the U.S. and one in Europe that I have links of in my frequently asked questions section. Which there is a link in the description of this video. If you want to find the FAQs, you can you can go there and, and get a hold of those cast producers uh, at pretty reasonable prices. I mean, I know for art students everything hurts, but the reality is, I mean, you got to spend a little bit. So uh, spending it on a nice cast um, from producers of cast that are vetted, uh, I think is is really worthwhile. I should also mention, right, I offer these a lot. That's like kind of a draw along. If you want to draw along with this, you can. So that's why I have the source image on screen. But also, if you want a higher res version of that, you can go to the Patreon post that is that is of this live stream. And attached to that is a download for this image. Uh, it's a free post. So even if you're not subscribed on Patreon, you can go to my Patreon, find that free post and download the image. It's just, it's on me. Enjoy that one, you know? Uh, and that way you can draw along with this with a, even a better image than, than what is here. So if that's what you want to do, uh, please feel free to go for it. And um, like I said, you can find, I mean, my Patreon link is everywhere. There's also a link in the description of this video that, that will take you to my Patreon page. So then Sopan, Sopan R continues their, their question saying, copying tones from a bark plate are relatively easier since they're clearly defined than looking for mid-tone and shadow tones in, in photographs. Yeah, I mean, barks are great because he's doing the translating. Like everything is a little bit there for you and you can kind of follow his lead. I mean, that, that's the idea, right? That you crawl before you walk. So your bark drawings are there to kind of help you define the parameters of what you're seeing. And I like to think about it in terms of like data points. So like if we say that looking from a cast or looking at a cast in reality in front of you with say natural light, <laughs> right? And this is natural light is constantly moving, always changing. Um, 
you would say that there are like 5 million data points and then you take that down to a photographic reference of that scene we are at you know two and a half million data points you come down to a bar again you're in the you know thousands of data points i mean that's the amount of like stepping back from nature that's happening and editing that's happening which by the way is is totally natural like i've said it before that in a way, I mean, the drawing that I'm producing now uh, on on the screen uh, and drawings that, that that I produce in general, or that that a lot of art history has produced, are relatively low res in relationship to say, like if you're, you know, looking at a, a, a wall size blow up of the highest res, you know, image that you can find. Which actually, I was talking with the people from the Penumbra Foundation, right? So there's this this place in New York in, in Manhattan where they do uh, old tin type photography and, and other types of um, like manual photography, historical manual photography. And my wife and I uh, took um, a tin type making course there, uh, like a workshop. And so apparently, and they were saying this, that that actually photographic resolution has really only stepped backwards since like the earliest days of photographic expo exposure. Um, but that's like a whole other story for people that are like really into photographs and know what they're talking about. I only remember the soundbite that, that, that was resolution a step back. Anyway, the point I want to make is, you know, paintings in comparison to like high res photographs or, or in comparison to what you see with your eye are relatively low resolution in terms of like how much information is being captured and documented. That's not like qualitative to say they're, they're worse. I think that, um, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, I prefer simplicity and I prefer editing from from artists and to see like what they take out and what they they find important and choose to leave in. So for me, maybe it's an improvement, um, but it's just worth noting, right, that we're not actually taking all of the information available. We're, we're taking a lot of it away. Right. Let's see. Uh, a lot of questions coming in. Vijay Kumar says. Uh, I've gotten comfortable with intermediate barb plates. The advanced torso looks very intimidating. Uh, talking now about the Belvedere torso. And also I want to start doing portraits, but I've never even drawn a portrait before. Yeah, <laughs> portraiture, of course. Actually, when I came into the academy, portraiture was something that you started actually after quite a bit of study. I think that in my first year, I did only one one or two proper like portrait drawings, set the model up, uh, you know, worked site size, did all the stuff that you're supposed to do. And eventually came to that place where I was making like a decent uh, portrait after the first year. I think nowadays it's a little bit different. People, um, people understand that like the focus can be portraiture, that you can, you can study that on its own in general and, and come to quite a high level doing that. Uh, but that wasn't the case for me. So I went through all the bargs and casts and things and then uh, went eventually into, um, yeah, into portraiture. Uh, so it shouldn't be something that you're like afraid of. I mean, I think I was a little bit intimidated by it because it was framed as such an advanced thing. It was like that, that, oh, after a year or so of drawing, then maybe you can think about a portrait. But uh, in retrospect, I think it could happen really a lot sooner. VJ is also asking, how do I get myself to move forward from bargs to portrait? Even blocking in a portrait from your atelier tier looks very intimidating. I think that you have to do it in terms of, like the intimidation factor is really all about experience. You know, I, I talk a lot about how getting into artwork or getting into new medium or whatever is a little bit like starting a new job. I used to work in restaurants a lot when I was a student and before I was a student. And you go into your new job and you don't know where anything is. You don't know where to stand to like be out of the way. Like you, you don't even know what you like, what the stuff that you need to know that you don't know. Uh, so over time, you kind of acclimate and you understand and you see other people doing things. And then you do that. Like if you need silverware, you need this, you know, whatever. Uh, just to continue the restaurant metaphor, you, you get a little bit more comfortable with where everything is because you get like that sense of the lay of the land. And that then the intimidation factor, I think, kind of just goes a little bit into the back of your mind. You kind of forget about it quite a bit. So I think that starting out, rather than starting out by making like a really long, elaborate portrait, you know, starting out and doing some portrait sketches, some like faster sketches that take you three hours, six hours, you know, tops, 
uh, and then you know making many of those you know the head in different angles and different poses and so on uh, before you kind of move on to maybe making a more I don't know advanced version or one that you intend to like really refine a lot further I think that's probably the useful thing to do like you know that sketching even at this level like where you're looking at at this right now you know this to me is like a decent head sketch even if your 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 sketch at the head doesn't go beyond this i think that's that's totally fine it's difficult to know maybe for students how to draw without having like a super critical objective you know without getting to like a high degree of realism or or a high degree of kind of resolution in your in your drawing um you know knowing how to kind of live in the bones of the drawing is something that you also have to get used to so uh, even there there's going to be some acclimation but like i said if you did you know a dozen heads that look not dissimilar to what this one looks right now or, or to that like level of refinement i think that that you have a lot to work with there in terms of, of creating that sense of familiarity let's see <laughs> <laughs> Sumya Dip Day says, good afternoon, Stephen. Uh, you look like an effing rock star. I'm not sure exactly how to take that. Um, I know it's a compliment, but I'm not sure what part of me looks like a rock star. Like maybe I haven't slept in a week. I look uh, I look haggard and tired. Perhaps that's it. Let's see. Um, yeah. Uh, right. Let's see. Mike L says, What's your take on Prismacolor pencils? I use for my drawings, let me just grab one here. Probably all of you have seen and heard this, but but I use these uh, these Faber-Castells. Um, these ones, they're the ones I settled on. I found them to be the most consistent and high pigmented uh, out of the ones that, that I've tried. I haven't actually tried the Prismacolor ones. I, I don't have a take, let alone a hot take on... Um, on, on Prismacolor pencils, but uh, if you put your take into the comments and you have experience with them, I will definitely read it out uh, and take it into advisement for myself about like what pencils I want to get. Because by the way, once I get into a material like forever, I'm 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 like choosing different ones and and buying different ones. If there's a colored pencil out there, I'll probably buy it in general. Neeks is asking, what would you say is the best blue for portrait painting? My current French ultramarine is not. Is almost finished, but I'd like to try something different. I think <laughs> the best. What is the best? Well, I'll say that the one that I favor, the one that I think works really well with flesh tones, is cobalt blue. It's very versatile. It dries really, really solid. It's got a great paint film. Um, uh, it's a good pigment just overall in terms of stability over time. Uh, it is very expensive. But kind of that's life. I mean, oil paint is going to be expensive. That's just the way it works. So it's going to be more expensive than your ultramarine. But if you go for genuine cobalt, I mean, you know that paint tubes last you quite a while. So you just have to think about how many painting sessions you're going to get out of that tube, right? You know, I don't even like really use a whole heck of a lot of cobalt when I'm painting. But, but when I do, it's like a nice pigment to have. So I could get, I could get, a hundred paintings out of a tube of cobalt really because i'm like i said i'm not using like big blue backgrounds and you know and um uh, using tons of it in the flesh tone so i would say go for cobalt it's not bad let's see lloyd ranjith coronel says will we see you again on proco yeah once proco's new site has embed features for live streams and like a live streaming feature, I'll, I'll definitely be doing a lot more on Proco. Uh, I really love Stan, love what he's doing there. He's a great guy, good teacher. So um, yeah, I, I really like working with him and his team. So definitely I will be doing stuff on Proco. It's just a matter of when. I mean, I, I go to my account there and, and, and see if there's people posting questions and stuff, you know, every few days. So it's not like I'm inactive on, on Proco's site. But uh, yeah, like until that streaming thing comes in, uh, it's like a limit, you know, like it's a limit to like how much I can do there because like what I'm doing a lot of right now is live streaming. Let's see. Sumya Dip Day says, also Alyssa is super beautiful. Her face is like a Roman sculpture. Yeah, when you find a good model, you stick with them, you know. 
Um, yeah, she's um, she's been great over the years. Jeff Kopsang says, Hi, Stephen. Are there certain brands of colored pencils you prefer? Are you using regular or colored colored pencil for your block in? Yeah, that well, I can say that I've settled on the Faber Castell. Castell? 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 I'm not sure how you pronounce that. I've settled on the Faber Castell ones partly because I've tried like a few different types and they were the one that really stood out in terms of performance. You know, also the thing you want to think about with colored pencils is that they're they're like really soft. And and that can be kind of a problem if you're trying to get like nice tight even values with them, which, you know, if you know my work, you know that I like to do. So they were the one that I thought kind of performed the best in that respect. There were other ones like from Derwent and other places that have a different consistency that, that I liked more or less for, for whatever reason, in most cases less. Yeah. Yeah. Emmanuel Alu is asking, what will the art of sketching video include? So yeah, he's referring here to a tutorial that is coming up on Patreon, probably after this block of Atelier tier assignments. So there's going to be advanced cast drawing, coming up on the Atelier tier. That's going to be a two-month project because let me tell you, it is a beast. If you thought the Belvedere Torso was a beast, advanced cast drawing is going to be heavy and informational and and really, by the way, really satisfying to do because we're getting into like white chalk and like toning your own paper with ink and stuff like that. So really exciting stuff. This is going to be a two-month project. After that, I have a project that I think <laughs> people will... All right, so I'm kind of... I'm not exactly sure actually what I'm going to do from the th for the third... Uh, month in this second term of Atelier tier assignments. What I'm leaning towards is actually getting into grisaille and flesh tone spheres, which I feel is super incredibly important and also wasn't done when I was a student. <laughs> so like the sphere is this incredibly important thing that sits like at the center of all of our conceptualizing about form. It kind of starts with conversations about the sphere. Uh, because it's simple, because we understand it from every direction, we can we can understand light on it in every direction. And so it gives us a great opportunity to conceive of how to use different mediums to represent that light. Now, I mean, you could say that, yeah, we could do just a portrait like that too. Well, yeah, let's say also that with portraiture, there's always like a lot of different complications that kind of go into it. You've got different surfaces, you have different local color values, you have all this different stuff. Uh, that's kind of going into it. So I'm thinking actually that the third term of the Atelier tier coming up, so it would be October, November, December, we'll actually be getting into these spheres uh, and getting into coaching and conversations about like how to use oil paint the right way um, when understanding like light and form. Um, and also that will branch into flesh tones, which will also branch into flesh tone mixing. Like, here's the thing. What's what's crazy about this is every now and again, I reflect and I think, oh, man, there's all these lessons that I need to get out there. And then I think like, oh, yeah, I only have 24 hours a day. Like, it's 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 actually really hard to, and I mean, I'm sure everybody assumes that it is, and it's not that everybody thinks it's easy, but it's really hard to like get together like a good comprehensive lesson, you know, that that kind of paints no pun intended paints the right picture about the information that you're that you're trying to like convey so uh, i'm working on on figuring that out and uh and, and putting that into it and I, the more i talk about it here and i know really it's just about communication i i say i think people would be underwhelmed because if you if you put it at its most base level you say like oh what you're gonna do a sphere like a sphere painting so what yeah, like there's so much inside of that, that 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 can benefit everybody from beginners, even to advanced, like some of the concepts that we'll work with are like super advanced. So I'm pretty convinced that that's what I want to do for, for December. Let's see if um, I'm able to get everything together and manifest that properly on camera uh, before that day comes. Oh, yes. Yeah, so the, Emmanuel was asking about the the art of sketching right so that's a colored pencil lesson now colored pencils here in this instance like of this tutorial are not so much going to be the focus i'm going to talk a little bit about the techniques that i use with colored pencil to to kind of get to where i'm taking them to 
Uh, but my objectives with colored pencil are different from those of, say, like Trumploy artists or, or hyper realist artists who are really trying to develop layers and layers and layers of color and depth. I'm using them very much as a sketching tool. And that's why I chose to call the lesson I'm going to put out the art of sketching, because primarily the concepts are going to be about the guiding philosophy behind how I conceive of and compose a, a sketch, something that's meant to happen fast, rapidly, right? Something that is almost performative, like, uh, like, you know, like singing a song or, or performing a dance. It's not about, you know, how long it takes you to do. It's about the way that you pull it off in the short time that, that you have, uh, the strategies I use to kind of get to that. Um, so there's going to be some interesting things to kind of break down about what happens actually before you start drawing, uh, what happens before you, you kind of even settle on the version of the image that you really want to work from uh, and the kinds of analysis that goes into that. Uh, in order to get to that place. Now, some of these things eventually are quite intuitive. But as like an artist who's been to this for whatever, you know, 15, 20 years now, um, it's useful to explain to students for whom it's like not very intuitive, like breaking down the intuitive process, what choices are being taken, uh, and what sort of paths you're you're choosing to go down. Yeah. So let's see what is next. Carmen Priest says, I finally did B Torah. It scared me to death. Oh, yeah, the Belvedere Torso. I finally did the Belvedere Torso. It scared me to death, but I did it. Not perfect, but I'm pleased. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then she, uh, Carmen is spell correcting that. Mm. The Belvedere Torso is intimidating. There's no way around it. Uh, you know, in the lesson that I made about it, I referred to it as like this uh, beast. And I stand by that. It's um, It's something that's, yeah, very much kind of one of those rite of passage projects. You know, when I was a student, you would go through, yeah, in the BARG program, uh, the school I went to, you'd go through, let's see, one, two, like three pencil BARGs. So that's graphite on, uh, usually on Canson paper. Some people use Stonehenge. And then you'd go through at least two charcoal bargs. So the, the second would be your Belvedere Tour. So some people go through three charcoal bargs as well. In Florence at the time, there's a really, really, really big focus on, on barg drawings. I think, I think probably, if I'm honest, maybe too much of a focus on, on barg drawings, but that's what it was at the time. Uh, and so by the time you got to the Belvedere Torso, like, yes, it was like a big challenge, but it was almost so much that you're so ready to get to cast drawing, like working from from something in the round that it like didn't matter. Like you were you were on it anyway. You were going to get it and finish it and and and, and sort it out uh, because you were so much desiring to kind of get on to uh, to get on to cast drawing. Um, that that you almost didn't even think about that it was intimidating, I guess. Like that was the thing that blinded you is your your desire to get to that place where you finally could could work from something in the round. Let's see. Tom Hoskins says, Hi Steven, would you suggest working from dark to light for definitive edge quality in form and cast shadows? I recently read a Lambert about a Lambert scale and how without this dark midtones can be too dark. Well, Tom, you know, there are things about drawing that are procedural, which is to say you, you should follow it this way to come to a result. And there are some things that are maybe there's a lot of different paths that you can take to get to it. From the description of your question saying, should you work from dark to light for definitive edge quality in form and cast shadows? Uh, it's kind of hard to picture all those as uniform situations. Like I know that that when you're drawing on a flat paper, like a form shadow and a cast shadow in a sense, like aren't different from each other because they're just flat shapes on a paper. But the reality is they're, they're coming into existence for totally different reasons. So when I would be working on the transition of a form shadow and working on the quality of an edge of a cast shadow, they're two kind of different procedures as far as I see them. So I, I don't know about coupling those two into the same into the same 
procedural group. Now, I know we're like really getting into the weeds, like academic weeds here, uh, but but I would be remiss just to not say it that way. Um, uh, in terms of like how the Lambert scale reacts to that, the Lambert scale, we're primarily talking here about the existence of form shadows and how that exists on the on the form shadow. Um, there is also, uh, um, I guess, in a sense, like the Lambert scale can have an effect on a cast shadow, but it's, but it's different in general. Um, but yeah, we're, we're like, we're really getting into the weeds. What I want to say is this. Uh, I see those two procedures as different. Working, working from dark to light is fine, but I tend to work uh, kind of from the mid-tones out, which is to say, like, I establish a lot of my shapes in mid-tone, crystal clear, before I actually key them to what the darks are going to be. So in that sense, I, I don't think that I just work dark to light. Uh, kind of build up the form in mid-tones and then go in for kind of darker accents like the core shadow on, on a form shadow edge, for instance. Limo is saying, I love the, quote, dither thing used by Harold Speed. Yeah, that's one that sticks with you. Dither's great. I've always heard the word dither associated to, like, old Scottish Gaelic uh, as, as its origin. I think that's what Speed says, that it's an old, like, Scottish word. And um, I did some etymological check up on it many many years ago but I, I i've since sort of lost what the word origins are if you would like to look up the word origin and put it into the comment section actually it'd be really cool to kind of bring up later in the stream but dither essentially right is that space that is in between something that is a little bit overly perfect and something that is a little bit too chaotic you want to get to a place uh, of rendering and refinement where there's still like a feeling not of imperfection, but space in between the perfection, right? Uh, and it's a quality that, you know, kudos to Harold Speed for trying to explain it in text. It's so much easier to see when, when you look at uh, a painting where that little space is in between ultimately something that is too refined and something that is a little bit under-refined. Rumen Plemenov says, how important is face anatomy structure compared to good observational skills and just drawing the shapes you see? I would say, Rumen, that it is, in my practice, is equally important. Uh, specifically, facial structure. Facial anatomy is very useful. And, you know, if you really want to drill down on representing a subject like, you know, the human form, then anatomy, obviously, you'd be it would be kind of silly to ignore it, right? Like you'd rather, the more you know, the more your ability to analyze and see will be will be heightened. So I say it's very important, but also facial structure. So we're talking about structure, right? Just to clarify everything across the board, whether we're talking about a drawing, or we're talking about the, the real legitimate three-dimensional form itself. We're talking about 3D, right? We're talking about a three-dimensional form of something. And so when we're talking about simplified structure, these are the things that go into like a blocking, right? So understanding the structure of the head is super important because you can't simplify it if you don't understand it, right? That's, uh, there's that saying that if you can't explain it to a 10 year old, then you really don't understand it yourself, right? Which I can't really speak to the veracity, you know, of, of that in, in all situations. I can say that about drawing and painting, it's very true that if you can't simplify it, right? If you can't do it well in a block, if you can't represent it, elegantly in a block in it, it does tend to me that you don't understand it uh, and and a lot of my understanding comes out of that place of, of understanding the complex structure of the head so that you can simplify it very important yeah let's see Mikel Mikel says I think it's critical to work under consequences free environment it's very critical to work under a consequences free environment Yes, a consequence free environment is great, and I think that there are a lot of a lot of benefits from that. It kind of takes the pressure off. Um, you know, the only counterpoint that I would put onto that is that at a certain point, testing performance is important, and uh, um, it's a kind of signal of accomplishment. And so, I think actually working in a pressurized environment uh, can also certainly reveal things to you about about yourself and your um, your abilities or, or, or your, your abilities in that moment, right? Uh, so like working on commissions or working professionally, I, I think is a great way actually to, 
yeah, to kind of set a mark for yourself to understand kind of where you're at. Um, uh, whereas, you, you know, if you always work in a pressurized environment, yeah, probably that's going to be inhibiting in terms of your your ability to just relax and kind of study things at the pace you need to study, which generally is slower than what you think it is. Let's see. Uh, JD Anarchy says, so no skull drawing this week, maybe next week. It's all possible. I got, I got, I got some really hectic weeks right now. Uh, so it, it all depends upon what I can do between between now and next week. We'll, we'll see. Dwayne DeCock says, "Hey Stephen, do you improve your ability to detect subtle shifts in value? Oh, how do you improve your ability to detect subtle shifts in value? You know, it's interesting that some things about a drawing." Uh, and this is this is why actually one of the reasons I really believe in kind of refining a drawing is that if you've really pushed a drawing to a really, really high degree of resolution, then you understand that at a certain point, there are things that are revealed to you by the, the rendering that you've made that you kind of couldn't quite see before. You know, subtle variations that help you to indicate the real idiosyncratic appearance of something those things uh, can often come, you know, towards the end of a drawing where you're really, really pushing for refinement and definition. Uh, so detecting subtle shifts in value, you know, a big part of that is developing the sense of like control and balance in your drawing. Sorry. <laughs> control and balance in your drawing so that you you find yourself in a place to be ready to actually recognize uh, and assess subtle shifts in value. In general, though, I'll say that uh, um, in the alternative of, of that, like of, of pushing a drawing to a really, really far place, understanding the integrity of the value plane is also like a really big part in, in understanding how to, um, to analyze and assess uh, very subtle value variations because in general, the plane, like the, the value of the, the, the large plane that it's on is as relevant to your assessment as the kind of variation in between two small shapes. Uh, I think that the difficulty that most people have is they only see the, di the, the difference in between, in between the two small shapes and two small values, and they rarely see it in the context of a larger plane on a three-dimensional form. Mike L says, it's hard for me to make a comparison because... They're my primary medium, but have a great waxiness to them. Now, Mike is talking about the Prisma colored pencils, so he's saying that that they have a great waxiness to them. Uh, that makes them sound like they're kind of like quite a quite a soft pencil. But again, like I haven't used them, so you know, I I simply do not know. <laughs> MJ Artwork is saying, "Hi, Stephen. On your Sphere video, what do you mean when you what do you mean when you bleached out the lights?" So. If I remember correctly, and by the way, the Sphere video is getting updated. So I did that Sphere video like several years ago, and it was pre-production value Patreon. <laughs> it was back in like, uh, all right, so when I started out Patreon, I was literally just, I had like a cell phone. And I had a cell phone that I bought before I, know, I knew I would ever do anything with video. So I think it was like one of these old iPhones that had like, 16 gigabytes of memory or something so if like if you're filming 4k 16 gigabytes gets you like i don't know like an hour tops like if you're recording on like a camera app that's meant to max out your your capacity of, of definition so all that that time ago that that's when i actually filmed my sphere video and it was like filmed as like a bonus content it was before i think i was even doing commentary on my my, my patreon videos were just me drawing some stuff Anyway, the, the point I want to make is uh, the, the redux is coming on that, uh, and it might come relatively soon. But when you're talking about bleaching out lights, you're talking about luminosity, right? So uh, form and, and uh, light effect are, in a sense, at odds with each other, right? Because what do we need in order to express form on a paper, right? We need value. So if you have a white paper, right, in a sense, you have no form. It's, it's a blank abyss of atmosphere. So when you start adding value to that, you can, you can push parts of that paper back. You can create a believable sense of form. 
Now, if you really focus on form, and you're showing all the forms as much as possible, that means you're going to be darkening and darkening and darkening. And that's naturally going to diminish, diminish a little bit the sense of bright luminosity, like bright glowing luminosity. So one of the things that you can do in order to increase the sense of luminosity is to bleach out a little bit the lights, right? Uh, and cameras do this all the time. Uh, it's one of the ways that that's kind of helpful to understand it, right? So when your camera, when you're out like in the city streets at night, right, and you're uh, you and your friends are sitting at a cafe and there's like street lights and stuff behind you or whatever. And you take a picture of your friend on your phone. What happens is your camera opens up the aperture, right? So it can see your friend's face in the light. What that does to the, the lights in the background is it takes like a pinpoint of light, right? That is like a light bulb in the background. And it creates this glowing kind of orb of light. So what it's, your camera is saying is that the light in that pinpoint is so bright when I open my, up my aperture, that it's actually bleaching out, right? Uh, the, the area, the zone kind of around that pinpoint of light. That's in a sense what we're doing when we bleach out the lights on a, on a subject, right? Is we're saying that the, 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 the center light here and or the, the, the highlight is so bright that it's actually affecting, it's glowing, radiating and, and, and bleaching out a little bit the areas around it. It's a way that you can like I said, increase the sense of luminosity if you choose to kind of key that way. Let's see. Krizia Chan says, Hi, Stephen, will you be releasing anatomy lessons in the future? Krizia, the anatomy lessons. So there could be one on portraiture that, that will come in the future. Uh, let's just see. Let's just see where that let's just see where that goes. Because partly because like anatomy lessons in specific are almost duty bound to be relatively comprehensive. And so you get into this game of like, well, do I try to make medically comprehensive anatomy videos or do you, or do you make practical utility based anatomy videos? And I would need to come down on one side of that. I know where my feelings are, but, but to bring something out like that out into the world, you would have to wonder which one you would go for. Now, Eventually, when on Atelier Forum, the, the, the new website that, that's coming up, uh, when I have my figure drawing course on Atelier Forum, there will be uh, a, a subcutaneous anatomy section so that, that we're going to go through and talk about really all the bony points that are relevant to your use when drawing the figure. Uh, which is to say bony points that are that are underneath the skin, uh, um, sections of the, the, the skeletal anatomy that are present and visible under the skin, and also uh, the subcutaneous anatomy, which is basically the forms as they are revealed under the skin. So uh, if you get to like, um, you know, the transverse abdominal muscles that are like below a couple layers, we're probably not really going to get into those, we're going to get into the ones that are immediately apparent uh, and have the most direct utility in terms of you realizing a, a kind of modeled human form. But that'll be on a different platform. The, I'll tell you, the most that would be on Patreon is facial anatomy. Uh, it'll never go into the full figure. That'll be uh, in subsequent courses, figure drawing courses on Atelier Forum. Paris D. Black says, <laughs> Paris D. Black says, Stephen, where do you get your hats? Hang on one second. I'm... Right, so... This is, uh, this is product placement here. They're not sponsoring me, but you see this little, uh, this little icon. Uh, there's a British shop called Gorin, G-O-O-R-I-N, Brothers, or B-R-O-S, period. Uh, that's where I get them. Uh, and uh, I, I like them actually just because they have like the shorter brim. That's really all I'm looking for. Uh, I don't like a big baseball cap, but as you, as you know, like when I'm working in the studio, like all my, my light is kind of coming from above. So you get into the habit of wearing this kind of studio hat. Uh, when I have light coming dramatically from above, like this kind of helps to block out the, uh, some of that from like kind of reflecting on, on the lenses of my glasses and stuff. <laughs> Fair question, though. Let's see. Uh, Kyber Kylo 77 says, do you have any tips on becoming a faster artist? I want to be more efficient with my drawings. Uh, set a time limit, set your materials and rinse and repeat, you know. Uh, speed is so much about the time available to you. So um, 
you need to get into repetitive circumstances, uh, which is to say, like, um, not changing up the variables of lighting situation, uh, or, or staying as consistent as possible with that, um, developing consistently, like an objective space to kind of end up for your uh, for your drawing. Um, uh, and then just rinsing, repeating, you know, give it 100 heads, you're going to get faster and faster every time. Uh, because, you know, I always say, I'm going to draw another horrible diagram. Uh, if you were at my last stream, you know that uh, I can definitely make some horrible diagrams. So if, for instance, uh, we have, let's see, the uh, start here and finish here. So that is the fast way to get from where you start to where you finish. When you're a student, very often your path from start to finish looks like that. So you go uh, on these different trips, uh, trying to figure things out uh, down blind alleys, and hopefully eventually you kind of come back to center and get to that place where you're trying to go. What eliminates that sense of like going everywhere uh, except a straight line uh, is experience, right? So not just experience, you know, in terms of like, yeah, I've drawn 100 heads, but you've drawn with similar concepts in mind, uh, that you've drawn with um, a similar materials, you know? Uh, when I'm learning a new material, you know, if I started today and said like, now I'm going to paint with uh, egg tempera and, and I'm going to like, I'm going to make that same journey of like twisting and turning uh, you know, taking 10 hours for something that should take an hour, right? So, so you, you have to get on that, that train of, um, consistent and uh, consistency and repetition. MJ artwork says, what anatomy do you advise students to study first for portraiture? Well, naturally you want to study the skull. Uh, you want to study it in depth as much as possible, drawing it from different angles, uh, because a lot of the head comes out of that. I would say that the skull and simplified concepts of, uh, of head structure probably have the most utility for students. Um, after that, like getting into facial anatomy, I, I still really prefer and really like a kind of a structural learning approach. So like you can, because, all right, here's the thing. You can find really cool anatomy diagrams right, like medical anatomy diagrams that tell you a lot about what's there. But in terms of like realizing their physical form, the anatomical diagrams oftentimes don't really resemble the the in situ version of that anatomy, like they look flat or abstract or weird or poorly rendered. Um, that's why it's so cool when you have an artist like Riche, uh, Paul Riche, the French um, uh, anatomist and, and artist whose illustrations of human anatomy come from such a refined place, like he has a fantastic aesthetic sense uh, and representational sense in, in his work. So um, his anatomy book, I think, is really superior for, for that reason. Um, yeah, and then other books, of course, like I've recommended before, like Anatomy for Sculptors, uh, does a great job of not only like showing you, yes, this this is X, Y, Z is there, but like what are the permutations in terms of like how X, Y, and Z looks as simplified forms. That kind of translation is really important. Let's see. Uh, Susan P. Faust is asking, how do you get to that point on your pencils? Uh, she's talking about the, uh, uh, the elongated points that uh, you often find on my, on my pencils and my drawings. Uh, it's just a, well, I'll show you. Yeah, it's just one of these. So a nice uh, long utility blade. Um, and then, yeah, I don't have it here. It's on the other side of my studio. But then just like a, a bit of sandpaper. So you rub it against the sandpaper over and over and you get to that point. Um, it's delightfully uncomplicated, but uh, has a lot of utility to it. Let's see, Swars. Wait, whoa, I just jumped past a bunch of questions. Hang on, hang on. Swars says, I'm sure you tried it, though on Prussian blue. Uh, I love it, it's cheap, fast drying. Um, 
but hard to handle. Incredible tinting strength. Love the color. Yeah, Prussian blue is okay. I know that Cornelia has, uh, my wife has more experience with that than, than I do. Uh, I've used it here and there. Um, I think that she really likes it as a pigment as far as I'm aware, but yeah, I have limited experience with it, uh, especially I would I would say that also when I did use it, maybe it was uh, way back when I was a student. And uh, so my, the relative degree to which I understood how to use it or not was uh, was shaky. So let's see. Uh, Mr. Devil SK says, what is the topic of today's stream? Uh, well, nominally, the topic is colored pencil drawing, but really, it's kind of just talking to you folks about what's what's going on. You know, I I was doing for a while, like kind of topic driven streams, and I thought it was I thought it was interesting to do. Uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe that'll come back in the future. We'll see. I don't know. Sumya Dip Day says, or by the way, like if you feel like there's a topic like these streams are just me wanting to like hang out and talk about stuff or, or whatever, just to, to be out there and kind of touch the culture a bit. Uh, so I'm really kind of open to them being just about anything. Uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll see. So Dib day says, I don't have access to the stone edge paper here in India. Bummer. Can you please suggest something else for me? I just don't want to pick up the wrong ones since they're also expensive here. Yeah, that that's, uh, that's a good point. You know, you're not going to go wrong with Canson's Mitong paper. Uh, again, I don't know if that's available there. Uh, Strathmore 400 sketching is is uh, a useful paper that you can get a hold of. It, it's really just about me not knowing what is available there to, to say. I mean, if you can touch the paper and, and get a hold of it and you find that it has a pretty fine tooth, a lot of times it's going to be pretty okay. Um, you know... But like I said, without having direct experience of it, it's 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 near impossible for me to say. But usually, those are the three big papers, uh, you know, in in my milieu that that I that I recommend. But by the way, uh, Sumya Dip, if you experiment with a few and like do some gradations and things, send me some images and see like what papers that you find are 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 good because. The reality is I do have a lot of subscribers in India. I know like on, on my Patreon page, for instance, there's 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 quite a few that I would love to be able to recommend something that is available, <laughs> that is available in, in India. I just, I, I wouldn't even know where to start to, to find out what it was. Let's see. Abhijit, or, oh wow, I'm not going to pronounce that right. Yeah, I think it's Abhijit Debnath, Debnath says how to deal with fear of missing out when we are making a portfolio. Yeah, you know, it kind of depends upon where you're applying. I remember, you know, <laughs> I remember a million years ago when I was just coming out of high school and getting ready for college, my high school art teacher said uh, that I should go to this, this art college fair. So I was supposed to develop a portfolio and like figure out what, what to do. So so I put together this portfolio of like drawings or whatever. They were awful. They were terrible drawings. <laughs> so I put together this portfolio of terrible work. And I went to this art college fair not knowing anything about art, not knowing anything about drawing properly. I mean, knowing less than anything. Um, so I get there and I'm going around to these like, these desks it's in this big auditorium in downtown miami and, and i'm going around to these desks of these people that are like vaguely interested in, in whoever's there and showing them my terrible work and they're all like yeah you know you can take a brochure or pamphlet or whatever um and i went to the one this is this is actually really this is super embarrassing so if you want to know super embarrassing rejection stories from my artist youth let me tell you so I went up to the one that was for the Lime Academy. At the time, I, I think I was probably 17. And I had like, I was a graffiti writer and like, I, I was from a whole different like world than, than that. And I didn't know anything about these places. So I went up to the Lime Academy desk and I handed my horrible portfolio of my terrible drawings. And uh, the guy like is like looking through it. And he's like half looking like over here and like flipping through and like, oh yeah, whatever, like, 
so not paying attention, like so clearly not paying attention and not being invested in, in what I was showing him. Maybe there's a dozen other places he would have rather been, uh, you know. But he said in the, the, the phrase that the sentence he told me still stays with me to this day. I remember it verbatim. He said that I guess like the best thing you have going for you is these uh, quirky drawings. Yeah, so so that was. That was my experience in portfolio development, and I was it was crushing. Um, but in terms of like developing a, develop, developing a portfolio, just make sure that the work that you're developing fits the school that you're developing for, and that means that you've got to do research about the schools that you're attending and kind of have a sense of like what kind of art education you're looking for. If you're looking to make representational work, just don't go to any university because chances are, I mean, at least I know in in the West. I don't know about in the East, but in the West. If you go to random XYZ university, you're likely going to have a faculty or a painting chair that is like a splatter painter or is non-objective or, you know, comes from an installation artwork background or something to, to where you're not really going to have that representational foundation in the education. Even if they're telling you that, oh, this is our, you know, drawing foundations class. In my experience anyway, and I know a lot of people's experience, those foundations are a little bit built on sand. Um, so just know your audience, which is to say the people on the applications board and know the school that you're applying to, uh, and that they have values that, that you share with them, that that's where you really want to be. Let's see. Sumya Dipday says, are you planning to do any digital painting tutorials? Planning to would be a stretch. <laughs> I mean, the thing is. I could probably do a decent lesson on how to um, how to draw like on Procreate or something, uh, something with a lot more intuitive design that I think people could get up on. Um, when it comes to like uh, Photoshop or something, like I'm I am a novice in Photoshop, so the idea of me teaching something on Photoshop would be uh, doesn't seem very well um, uh, conceptualized. Uh, however, I, I could understand, like, I could do Photoshop for people who need the bare minimum from Photoshop. I could do I could do that class. So you, you guys can tell me if, if that's interesting to you. Let's see, Sumi Dip Day is asking, and when is your website launching? The price for your Patreon sub is super affordable, but I really can't get a hold of a credit card since I'm an unemployed artist. Yeah, the... Um, so it was referring to Atelier Forum. Uh, the launch date is uh, soon-ish. I mean, that's the best we can do. Like I've got, uh, speaking of hats, I've got, I wear like a lot of different hats and um, all of them are in conflict with each other because they all want my time. So that generally means that I, I can't make big promises about like debut dates. As soon as there's a date for it, like definitely I'll be saying we're, we're not far out. You know, I mean, it's a month in the future probably uh but i just have to develop some some content and get some things ready for um for for that launch there's a lot to it um there will be for that like i think paypal will be an accepted pay option and, and also uh stripe which takes care of a lot of different like kind of payment methods i think also you can use paypal for patreon unless i'm missing my you can feel free to correct me about that um, but I, th I think there are some alternative methods on, on Patreon as well. Let's see. Uh, Saeed Faisal Fahim says, what is the biggest difference you found while working with colored pencils as opposed to graphite? Difference number one that makes colored pencils a pain to work with <laughs> is how absolutely incredibly soft they are. Like if you work on like a hard sized paper with colored pencils, like they crumble under the under the paper and you really can't get into that um, super refined place that, that you can with with graphite. So so that's that's probably the the thing that I've had to adapt the most to. It's actually why, um, you know, working on this moleskin paper, for instance, that that this drawing is on uh, that I didn't prefer. Um, uh, is actually that sense of like having a harder paper that 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 fought the pencil a little bit. Whereas the Stonehenge oil paper, which I just by the way just got a message from the Stonehenge people from or from the Legion from Legion paper saying that 
their their prospective launch date for the Stonehenge oil painting paper is the end of October, early November. Obviously, things keep getting pushed back, but they've given me an official word now that that's the target that they've got. Uh, so stay tuned in October uh, because fingers crossed, you know, things are, are really going to happen there. It's going to be available. What I love about it is it's thick, fibrous, and soft, uh, and I can really press into it with the, with the colored pencils and kind of get some good value out of them. Uh, but yeah, that's my big gripe, my big uh, complaint. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Let's see. Um, there's some comments in the comments between commenters. Rumen Plamenov says, mid-17th century in the dialect sense tremble, quiver, a variant of dialectic didder. So, yeah, uh, Rumen is referring to the etymology of the word dither, which I was saying I, I had some vague recollection, had some Scottish derivation. Um, Rumen is saying here, mid-17th century variant on, uh, variant of dialect uh, dither. Yeah. Which, by the way, uh, what, in what country actually Rumen was um, the, that, that origination from? I would love to know. Foggy Planet says, you mentioned sketching as a performance. Would you ever plan a sketch based on making an interesting process rather than steps to a finished piece? Yeah, I mean, there are more performative ways to go about sketching. I think that the common one that's interesting is where you start out with something super chaotic and then you eventually bring it together into something representational. I, I For me, it would be, tr it would be difficult to want to do the performative as opposed to the productive or or something that that kind of comes into a place eventually but you know I have in the past worked in a way that was like more chaotic not not because I was doing anything performative with it but just because that's what kind of I was exploring at the time uh, and I found that that eventually in some ways maybe it was a little bit counterproductive but it can be fun and kind of engaging I actually have thought about Recently, I had some inkling of of doing something like that uh, for, yeah, more for the aesthetic values of it than, but but naturally, everything I do now, I do on camera. So would it, would it have a performatively useful element as well in terms of like connecting people to it out there in the world? Yeah, sure. And in fact, you know, now while while we're here, why don't we just discuss like like social media and art and the intersection in between the two and how difficult an intersection that is you know i think a really common comment or question that i get from people is about really about compromise they're saying like do i have to do this to become a popular artist do i have to do that to to be like popular on social media and i mean increasingly the divide in between what i see as the values of representational painting as i see it and what can be popular on social media is the gap is widening. Uh, and I think it's probably really challenging for people just getting into that arena to, to build audiences. Um, I, think it's, I think it's probably more challenging than it has been, like, like really. Especially like when you start to look at something like TikTok, for instance. I think TikTok is a place where, frankly, like, I, I mean, you, you know, you learn to never say never, but I, 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 I don't think I can make content that can be popular on TikTok. If the content that I make, you know, for instance, like for Instagram or something, happens to become popular on TikTok, that that's great and that's fine, and and I'm, you know, I'll post there or whatever. Uh, but I just don't think it's I don't think it's a platform for for my values necessarily now now saying that it's not like i'm cutting it like a black and white issue like it has to be one thing or it has to be the other uh, um and like i said i have an account on tiktok and i will probably post stuff to to tiktok um but i just just assessing it professionally like i i don't see it as like a really huge growth opportunity mm. but we'll see we'll see where that goes yeah let's see Kristen. I think I'm saying that right. Kristen McIntosh say, or McIntosh says, when approaching a portrait with extremely soft rendering and many lost edges, does that change how you approach the block in? 
Uh, no, not really. Um, there, there are some things in terms, and, and actually, interesting that you bring this up, right? Because with advanced cast drawing coming up, like I said, starting out October 1st, we're going to do a live stream. It's going to be super intense. One of the things that's present in this one, because it's such a big project, uh, is that there, there is finally the right moment for me to express the divide that I've been talking about for a really long time, which is there are drawing uh, or there is drawing that I do for the purpose of demonstration, right? Which is long, labor intensive, slow, complete at every stage, complete at every moment, perfectly harmonious at every moment, uh, because it has to be to show the idea. And there is drawing that is expedient, right? There is drawing that is professional, where all those like neatly cut out stages that I that I put into the work, just so that it's descriptive, they blend together. Uh, so this is going to be one of the drawings where you start to see those stages blend together. Uh, and so when I'm working on something that I know is going to be like full value, there's definitely things that I do. Like in the next drawing that comes up, I'm going to be working like starting out with, I think I start out with a 4B pencil. So a really soft, really dark pencil because I know where I'm going. I want to get there sooner rather than later. And I know that value buildup takes a long time, especially when you're trying to get into that chiaroscuro world that, that we're going to do with, uh, with this advanced cast drawing. Kristen is also following up with a question. How do you block in facial features without creating hard edges in the drawing later on? Uh, it's all about intention. You know, edges are a matter of mentality. It's not actually a technical thing. We can all draw a soft edge. We can all draw a hard edge. Um, it's just a matter of like what we actually go into the drawing to do. When I take my pencil and I put it onto the paper, there's a clear definition of what I want to do. And in general, that what that's what happens. It's when we go a little bit onto autopilot or, which probably is, is more likely, we're actually not sure what we're supposed to be doing or of the grander spectrum of edges that are necessary in the drawing that we wind up making those hard edges. Let's see. Uh, Tejas Wakade Arts is asking about the paper. FAQs link at the bottom of this video on YouTube, you will find an FAQs link full, full to the brim with totally free information about the lights in my studio, the pencils I use, the brushes I use, the casts that I draw from, all that stuff is there uh, and totally free. Along with, I should mention now as well, um, for those of you that like want a better res image of this to draw from, there's a post on my Patreon page, it's a free post open to the public where you can go and actually download this image. You just gotta follow the link in the description of this video to my Patreon page, get to that post, and it's downloadable. It's right there, free for everybody in the world. <clears throat> um, I also want to say, by the way, I wouldn't be a responsible proper YouTuber if I didn't say at some point during the video. If you like the content, you're watching, you think it's really cool or even marginally cool, or you just want to do me a favor even though you think it's not cool at all, please just hit the like button. And if you want to be notified about other videos that come up, uh, you can definitely subscribe to this channel. But definitely hitting that like button it's a big favor to me because it kind of boosts the uh, stream. It lets YouTube know that something relatively cool is happening here. <laughs> right. Manaj Adikari. Manaj Adikari says, is Bark Study important to draw portraits or know the value? It's useful. I mean, there's a lot of different ways in. You know, I know a lot of schools use Barg. A lot of schools don't use Barg. You know, uh, you know, one way or another, starting from 2D work and copying master studies, excuse me, master studies is a really useful way to like get into to understanding the, the fundamentals of, of drawing. So yeah, let's see. Caroline Cheng is asking, and each, each shape has to be clearly defined regarding what you said about the large shape. I think Caroline's referring to what I was saying about like the big, big planes of the head, the big structure of the head. Uh, clearly defined is a relative thing. You know, early on in a drawing, I think that you want to keep things relatively less defined or less resolved. 
uh, later on, then you can kind of transfer those into being kind of clearly resolved. In fact, you know, I find that a lot of times with with a drawing, you want to anchor it in certain places, which is to say, like, have features that are more clearly defined, have features that are crisp, but you don't want to do that everywhere. You want to do that only in a few places. As far as like developing structure from the initial block in, yes, everything has to be properly resolved at a low level of resolution uh, uh, in a uniform and harmonious way. Let's see, Trigon Joy Majumder. I, I, by the way, I, feel, I do feel like I'm getting genuinely better at pronouncing names like on the fly. Uh, I'm not going to pat myself on the back because I'm probably pronouncing this one wrong, but uh, I feel like I'm getting better at it. But uh, Trigon Joy Majumder says, What's the size of the head in your, in this artwork? Asking because I always wondered what's the difference uh, between the sizes of the reference and the actual drawing. The head in this one is probably, I'd say probably about half life size. Maybe a little bit smaller, a little bit lower than half life size. Uh, and then whatever reference I was working on, it's probably just on my iPad. So uh, it would have been smaller than that. Yeah. Pads is saying, which pads, by the way, has uh has there's a thing on youtube called super super something but anyway like you can like tip somebody that's live streaming and, and pads has done that so i appreciate that um but i've also just lost the comment i was looking for here we go Pads says it is common that some artists do portraits slightly lengthier or slightly wider uh or is it that the artist's subconscious do that and the third person sees the slight difference I have that problem too. Yeah, usually there's things about height, height and width. One of the difficult things that I find also with, like, like in this instance, um, is actually when I'm filming. Like, I'm naturally always filming from the side. And you can actually see a little sliver of my uh, of my camera. This is usually where it sits when I'm drawing. Like, that's usually the difference distance between like me and the camera. And uh, so, like in in post production, I have to like get it back to what it actually looks like with no perspective. Uh, so especially my early videos on Patreon, there's like some distortion that makes them actually quite a bit skinnier uh, than they should be. That's that's my uh, <laughs> defense of my own proportional issues. But yeah, like if you're not doing your height and width uh, proportion checks at the at the beginning of the drawing, it's very easy to to mess up the height versus the width and wind up with something, uh, um, you know, wider or, or skinnier or whatever. Um, the antidote to that, of course, is just good measuring checks at the be at the beginning of your drawing. Uh, JD Anarchy is saying, "Can you explain the bony landmarks of the face?" Yeah, but it's in depth, and uh, probably I would want better visual aids to do that than to just uh, rattle them off. So let's just table that and say it's a great topic, and definitely I will talk more about it either in tutorials or. Um, it, it almost is, well, actually come to think of it when I did the centerline construction workshop, which is still available on my Patreon, just as a video that you can watch. I did it live, but, but the recorded and edited version is available there. When I did the centerline construction workshop, I actually explained a lot of the bony points that are relevant on the face in great detail and with extensive visual aids. So I would definitely point you to that. Um, which is something that I'll also probably revive uh, in, in subsequent videos as well. But it's 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 complex, and there's a lot of like specific names involved. Let's see. Reynola Dominguez says I use both Prismacolor and Faber Castell, uh, referring to the conversation about colored pencil brands. <laughs> Gilgamesh is saying get a, sp a sponsor from the uh, hat company. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> it's ironic that actually I probably should because I literally wear this hat in like every single video I've made for for a few years. Um, let's see. Gazal Preet Gill says, which university do you recommend? Uh, university? Like if it has to be a proper university with like a diploma program and, and that, I don't even know, to be honest with you. Yeah, that is a blind spot for me. In terms of ateliers, there's there's several that um, that I that I think can be uh, can be very good. 
uh, definitely, you know, uh, GCA and the Lime Academy are on that uh, on that list, and um, the Florence Academy is on that list. Um, yeah, th- I mean, there's there's several schools out there that I think are are very good, but I, I don't know anything about universities specifically, though. Let's see. MJ is asking, what about the fat pads you mentioned in some of your tutorials? There are fat pads there. They're important, especially on the face, because they cover up uh, significant you know, anatomical features that nonetheless you should know because they are underneath the fat pads. So uh, in that sense, like facial anatomy has to go a bit deeper than subcutaneous to be probably truly meaningful. Victor Rodolfo is asking, how do you reach the next level? Meaning that you know there is a new challenge that you haven't mastered. Uh, For instance, you have a strong sense of anatomy, likeness, rendering, but composition is not as strong. Um, well, reaching the next level, maybe it's one of those ideas that is like stages in a drawing. It always seems like it's more popular idea than it is realistically useful. I, I never felt like I reached the next level, you know, in, in drawing. It's just you accumulate so much experience over a very long period of time. Eventually, yeah, you kind of know what you're doing. So I guess that's the level. Uh, but I never really felt it. I never felt it when I was drawing. I never finished the drawing and went like, man, I'm on the next level. <laughs> Conversely, I started a lot of drawings thinking, I'm totally on the next level. Uh, and then realized uh, subsequently that I was not on the next level. So it's it's this kind of fleeting uh, um, uh, you know, sense of perception about your own um, ability to do stuff that maybe fuels this sense of, of next levelness. Uh, but in terms of like how do you how do you level up your skills, usually that's going to come from the introduction of a new and vital piece of information um, uh, and a new series of practical solutions that you need to practice and integrate into your work. Um, couple that with just a lot of experience using them. That that's that's how I progress and that's how I envision students' progress. MJ is saying he needs uh, the Photoshop tutorial for the bare minimum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Let's see. Kristen McIntosh is asking, how will the Atelier Forum differ from the Atelier Tier on Patreon? So, th- yes, I understand what you're getting at there. So, the Atelier Tier on Patreon is me reconfiguring or, or reconstructing the curriculum that I passed through as a student and that I taught for about 12 years into what I would have made out of it. Because naturally, being a teacher in a program, uh, rather than a director of a program, uh, I was responsible to teach the curriculum as it was, rather than to form the curriculum myself. Now, having been the director of Anatomy and Equiche, I understand how gratifying it is to actually construct and build your own curriculum exactly as you see it, and with the values that you see as important. So. Uh, I decided maybe six months ago that I was going to do that on Patreon. I was going to start with Barg number one and go all the way to like the uh, the end and advanced projects. This is realistically something that's going to take a very long time to produce uh, over many, 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 many months. And the end result will be that after all of that time, I will have accumulated all those lessons and, and I will compile them together uh, into a comprehensive course that will be available just on its own. What Atelier Forum is, uh, for starters, is a place where I can teach figure drawing because figure drawing is naturally a not safe for work activity and I don't want to change the safe for work rating on my Patreon page. I like that you can be any age from very young to very old and, and, and find my Patreon without any disclaimers about you know content. That's very important to me. Um, But I have many, many, many years of experience in figure drawing uh, uh, that is not getting expressed anywhere. And Atelier Forum is a place where I'll do that. So I'll teach that as a workshop on Atelier Forum. The reason it would be a workshop and not like a permanently available video uh, is just because I can't be on Atelier Forum all the time, but I can take a week out of the year. I can teach that course there. Um, And that can be like a really gratifying thing, both for me, but also for the people that get to take that course. So Atelier Forum will be more about one-time purchase. So like my Patreon videos, 
the minute that you unsubscribe, then they are gone to you forever. Um, with what's on Atelier Forum, you will pay a price, which is immediately a little bit larger, but you will be you will own the video forever. You can watch it over and over and over. Uh, you know, yeah. So so that that's gonna be the primary difference. Also, let's say this: what I'm really excited about on Atelier Forum is actually that it's on a platform that is built specifically to streamline uh, and make as trackable and simple as possible uh, the student interaction with instructional videos. Uh, so there's a lot of like, it's it's much easier to like track your progress through courses um, um, and and to to interface with them in a way that's like crystal clear, super smooth. Uh, really excited about that part of it. Jasmine is saying, uh, Stephen, for someone who can't afford to get a classical atelier education at a good school, is it possible to get to that level of proficiency? If yes, what steps would you suggest? Is it possible? E everything is possible to you, Jasmine. Um, the the difficulty, the, the challenge that you face uh, is really a lot more about the implanted sense of motivation that you experience when you have paid tuition at a school. So uh, even 20 years ago, uh, when I went to the academy, uh, it was about 2,500 per term. So that made it like, whatever, 7,500 per year uh, to go to the academy. But I had to move to Italy, I had to pay that money. And therefore, like, there wasn't going to be anything else that I was going to be doing, you know, seven days a week, six to seven hours a day, eight hours a day. Um, that is that motivation is largely responsible for for like how you you get better. Um, so what you face, what what do you exchange, right? For let, let's say, for instance, you start following the Atelier tier on Patreon. Like I've made the first uh, three terms worth of videos uh, going all the way from beginning Varg to beginning cast or intermediate cast, actually. Um, if you follow along with that, it's really up to you to supply the motivation and the hours of work. The concepts are there and laid out in a super crystal clear fashion. If you don't practice them, of course, you can't improve. You can't get to that level. So uh, if you are able to take the money that you save and supplement your attention, interest, passion, motivation, yes, you absolutely 100% can get to a very high level, um, especially with what's available today. Like what's available on my Patreon, for instance, 20 years ago, that literally just did not exist, was not out there, wasn't going to happen. You weren't going to come across the information. So... Uh, yes, I think it's possible. Um, there is a level of challenge, but I mean, that's why I do various things like have a Discord server with with places where we're uh, like the critique feed where students are explicitly posting work to get feedback. Um, uh, you know, I do things like these live streams where I'm constantly giving people feedback about, um, you know, thoughts, philosophies, et cetera, things that can shape your educational experience. Um, as much as possible, I try to supplement that fact that that yeah, you you haven't paid a fortune and arrived at a new country and and you only have one thing to do and that's draw. Let's see, Phyllis Riley says I just searched the entire website and can't find. <laughs> Phyllis Riley says I just searched the entire website and can't find your hat. Wanted to get for my college age grandson. <laughs> Maybe post a link on the FAQ sheet. All right, this, this, the next amendment to my few, uh, frequently asked questions uh, will be that I will put a link to the Gorin Brothers. Uh, I think it's a cadet cap is what you're looking for, uh, C-A-D-E-T. Um, but yes, I will put a link to the Gorin Brothers hat on my uh, Patreon FAQs because it is so ubiquitous in my videos. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, we've got we've got some time remaining here. We've got 20 minutes left in this drawing. You can see, by the way, the drawing is kind of coming to a place of realization. There's still eh, still tweaks that got to be made, though. Uh, Rumen Plamatov says, My search confirms that Dither is Scottish, as you said. Uh, all right, so the um, the original, or, or like the, the, the place of origin for the word Dither uh, is a 17th century uh, Scottish term. 
Let's see. Caroline Cheng says, what should we prepare for October 1st drawing paper wise? Caroline Cheng, I'm so happy that you asked. I'm going to be releasing a video uh, about certainly stretching the paper. So it'll be another paper stretching video that's really explicit, but it's also going to have the ink toning section. So I'm going to tell you about the ink that I use. I'm going to show you the mixture. I'm going to show you how I apply it to the paper. Uh, in the paper toning video, the thing that I'll tell you that actually isn't in the video is that I like to use subsequent layers to get just the right value. So I don't just select one value and put it on and it's perfect for good. Like I, I augment with like adding other layers of ink to it because I have the paper stretched over panel. I could make a hundred passes of, of ink wash on it uh, and it would get more even and darker as, as it goes. Um, uh, because I feel like I can always put on another layer of ink wash, but I can't, I can't reduce an ink wash. I can't make it lighter than, than what it was. Um, so if you, if you make your first ink wash tone and you feel like you want it to be darker, just another ink wash tone is going to be the, the answer to that. Um, but that video will be coming out ASAP. It's the 22nd right now. We have, uh, about, um, a little over a week before we get to the end of the month. So the lesson notes and the paper prep video is going to come out ASAP, Caroline, on Patreon. And uh, you'll be able to download the lesson notes and prepare. Uh, you'll be able to um, uh, watch the Paper Tony video and, and prepare your own paper for the lesson as well. Uh, let's see. Sumi Dip Day says, Sorry, Stephen, I tried but can't enroll to your Patreon through PayPal as it requires an instant funding source for recurring payments. Yeah. Unfortunate. But yeah, that's kind of... Sorry. I just realized I have like a hair from my beard in my mouth. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so Sumi Dip Day says, how do you manage to draw or render faces of people who have fuller infraorbital triangle uh, and furrow or cheeks? The highlight seems to hit a larger area on their faces, unlike Alyssa here. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, you're talking about like highlights on larger forms. It's just going to be a little bit more diffuse. So like the, the larger, softer the form, uh, the more the center light or even a specular highlight, highlight would be more diffuse. So you just have to work with softer edges. Let's see. Michelle Ra Rache, Rash Rache says, All I can say is thank you for adding balance to my art world. Yes, Western education is crazy. It's all hurry up and get it wrong with zero consistency between instructors. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to go to school. My apologies. I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry, my watch decided that I was talking to Siri for some reason, and uh, now that is recorded on live stream for uh, all of forever. I'm grateful for the opportunity to go to school. Funny what you do is what I thought school was going to be. Michelle, welcome to the world. That's what I thought art school was going to be too. So as a young person, I, I went to art school in North Florida, and I, I went there to learn how to draw and paint stuff that kind of looked like stuff. Uh, and eventually I did not find that, uh, that that's what happened there. And a lot of people do that. A lot of people discover that after going to the school. That's why I was saying, like, you need, when you're going to university, like if anybody's, you're in high school, you're thinking about going to school, what are you going to do? Research the faculty at the school you're going to, because the work they make is going to reflect the philosophies that they have. And if you have a drawing teacher that makes non-objective work, that's a problem. So don't go to that school. That's what I'd say. Let's see. Kyber Kylo 77 says, do you have any other hobbies besides drawing? What are they? Well, hobbies, hobbies, hobbies. Do I have hobbies? I was actually talking about this the other day with, uh, with Cornelia and I feel like I probably need one. <laughs> it used to be, I would have said years ago, I would have said skateboarding. Um, but I just haven't really made time for skateboarding since I lived in Sweden. So it's been quite a few years since that. But no, I, you know, I don't really have hobbies. It's kind of lame to say that, but I, I kind of don't. Seventh Son One says, could you tell us something about you and Cornelia's studio lighting? Things like bulbs, color temperature, etc. Yeah, there, there are in the FAQs, there are some, uh, there is some information. However... I will tell you that the information is about optimal stuff. So I use continuous video lighting, which is in general very expensive. Um, what you want to look for in the lighting that you choose is the lumen count and the CRI rating. So color 
refractive index or, or color reflective index. I think it's refractive index. Um, so the lumens is how powerful the light is at distance. Uh, so there is like the lumens drop off as 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 the the, the light source and the uh, subject hit by the light source uh, get further and further apart. So you want a high 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 lumen account or lumen count, and you also want like for natural lighting you want like a CRI that's like ninety two or over. Uh, so those are two factors you can check to find out, and and those ratings are standard across uh, all different kinds of uh, of lighting. Let's see. MJ is saying, uh, October marks the month you first started doing live sessions, the Centerline Workshop, which means you've been doing it for a year now. This is, uh, this is a good point. I've been doing a lot of live streams because I feel like... So I used to do like a lot of pre-recorded, like even scripted content. And while I stand by that content, I think it's great content. I mean, the fact of the matter is, like as a communicator, I... As I say this now, watch me like totally mess up everything I'm saying. But I feel quite comfortable and confident to speak my mind as it is. Like the ideas that I talk about are things that I've been using in practice for so long that it's not like I go and, you know, compile notes from research in a book and then just try and recite it. Like these are things that I do and things that I know intimately. So I'm I'm actually a little bit probably more comfortable doing live sessions in teaching than I am actually doing scripted sessions in teaching. And I realized that there was kind of a bit of a production bottleneck that I was experiencing because uh, I was I was trying to do it in what I thought was the right way. But I actually think for me and what I do, live sessions are just more appropriate because of what I teach, who I am, and how I teach it. So live sessions are great. I have been doing them for, for a year now. And I feel like I've really refined the sense of like the kind of software I use, the, the, the setup that I have, like, and also my own interaction with it. I'm much more comfortable than I was before. Let's see. Let's see. What's going on here, people? I got more questions coming in. J Jamie, you know, so there's an accent on the E at the end of this. So I don't know what that means, but I'm just going to pronounce it like an American would do it. So Jamie G says, Barg takes a long time in depth process. Nah. <laughs> yeah, well, Barg does take a long time. I mean, you know, there are faster ways to, to draw and to sketch. But one of the things you have to think about is when you go in, right, there are processes that have a higher ceiling than others. Like, so when you think about blocking in a drawing, I've always thought about it this way, that the block in is the hypothesis. Pushing the drawing forward ultimately into refinement is where you actually prove or dis disprove the hypothesis. So if your hypothesis was good, you will come to find out that at the end, all the structure was in place that was necessary for you to realize a fully refined drawing that looks a lot like your subject. If your blocking was bad, your hypothesis was incorrect, you will find that at the end, your drawing crumbles because there was no structure underneath it that, that helped you to understand and manifest a really realistic drawing. There are drawing processes that never really go to that place of refinement. And so they never really prove that hypothesis. Now, I'm judging this within the canon of work that is like I am and that I make. So I, I don't want to be unfair to other ways. I'll just say, if you want to sketch, sketch. If you want to make refined drawings, understand that, that it will be a process. Nobody really makes super refined drawings fast. I mean, you can be faster than you are now. It used to take me 75 hours. Now it takes me far less. But, but nonetheless, I think if you looked at my process, you'd go like, wow, it takes a long time. Camilo Rodriguez says, Hi, Stephen. When you draw from a picture reference or from life, do you use comparative measurements or sight size? A combination of both. What are the pros and cons of both? I use comparative, uh, and I would say, like, even more than, more than comparative, what I use is structural analysis. So with a good structural analysis, you can have comparative measurements that, that work really well. Um, sight size is something that, that has phased out of my work a lot, not because I think it's bad, it's great. Especially, by the way, for students, it can be very good because it's very demanding like to have your work uh, um, in such a clear proximity to your subject. But it, it's just very like space intensive. And uh, throughout various times, I haven't 
sometimes I don't have a lot of space to work in. Sometimes I do. Um, but but that's why that, that has phased out eventually. Um, yeah, pros and cons. I mean, the list you could go on for, for ages and ages. I mean, more time than we have left in this in this live stream, you could go on about the pros and cons of it. I think um, what's good for comparative uh, is that I think that it uh, it relies and it fuses well with a, a sense of structural realization in a drawing. Um, site size is really great because, like I said, it's very demanding when you have the image and the subject, you know, in a one-to-one -one ratio to each other, kind of right in front of you. So it's also really great to like interact as a teacher with students working site size again because, um, uh, yeah, it's so like kind of close together um, uh, and noticing the differences is very simple. Let's see. Rumen Plamenov is asking, funny question, but what is the essence of the note taker job on my website? Yeah, so there's a, a hiring page on my website. There's a few different job descriptions there uh, of positions that I'm kind of always looking for. But the note taker position in specific um, is just that I want to... Um, I, I want to develop from the content that I put out like a coherent linear note narrative uh, that goes along with each lesson. So I, I want... A, a text-based version of my lessons that is as coherent as my description and demonstration of them. Um, uh, because people learn in different ways, I want, it's important to have that text-based version um, lively and making sense and using visual aids. So right now I'm kind of interviewing people uh, for just to see like their ability to like comprehend and comprehend what's there and translate that. Um, and also, you know, use other media to to insert into that as well uh, via diagrams, etc., to to make uh, explicable and descriptive the lesson, but in text form. Let's see. Brenda Branch is saying hello, Stephen. I find I create better likenesses with anatomical correctness when I make quicker marks. Shadows and values later are slower. That's when I have the most trouble. Help! I need suggestions. Um, <laughs> Brenda, I mean, you know, the process, uh, thinking of splitting the process apart into different, um, different aspects, uh, is, you know, um, I'm, what I'm trying to do is avoiding calling it like a false narrative. <clears throat> Basically all these things fuse together and kind of feed into each other. What it sounds like to me, uh, is that your analysis and understanding of, of the visual impression and how light and shadow appropriately work together is what's actually missing um, and that is different from like structural anatomical analysis um, eventually they are a continuum one should travel very easily into the other uh, but just like you learned anatomy there is an anatomy to to the visual impression as well that that you also have to come to understand uh, mj artwork is asking for some reason whether i use a fountain pen I have been given a fountain pen by someone once, but I'm not sure that I've ever used it for much of anything. So no. <laughs> Sumya Dave Day is following up on, uh, to Phyllis Riley and says that he just found the uh, the Gorin Brothers hats on <laughs> on Amazon. So uh, so it is available. Uh, to be to be bought out there, you can have a studio hat just like mine <laughs> if you want one for whatever reason. Mikhail says, "I'm drawing along with you, and now my back hurts. What do you think the ideal drawing position is? Ideal drawing position is right here. You want to be drawing vertical. Whenever I'm drawing, it's as vertical as possible. Like the closest that I come to drawing uh, not vertical is like my desk easel. I have like an easel that I, I built for for my desk." is tilted back a little bit. That's about as far as I go away from vertical. Anything else, uh, you know, I find I'm doing, I'm doing this, I'm bending down, I'm hunching over, uh, eventually just not a good vibe. Um, the thing is, you don't have to spend a tremendous amount of money to make like a, a good tabletop easel. You know, I've got right here, this is, uh, this is the one that I keep by my, my desk all the time. Uh, and you can see it's really, it couldn't be more simple than, than what it is. Um, you know, just a couple of clamps, clamping and some stretch paper onto a drawing board and some wedges of wood on the side of that. Uh, yeah, easiest thing in the world to make, super cheap to make, and, and it'll get you um, uh, drawing vertical easily. The thing I'll say is you, you got, you're going to have to ruin your table because you've got to drill 
you got to drill some holes in to, to anchor it onto the table uh, so it doesn't like topple over. Let's see. Uh, Jamie G says, so if you can say my name as American, then I can say football is soccer. <laughs> I think it would be, uh, well, you know, if you're in America, you probably got to say soccer, don't you? Um, and she says also, uh, Jamie is fine. It's French. So, uh, Jamais. Um, Jamais, I guess, is how you would say that if you were French. <laughs> probably not doing that right, but that's as close as I can come. And she says, I appreciate your uh, response on Bard. And uh, let's see. Mikhail says he's drawing in bed. It sounds very relaxing, but I'm not sure I would be capable of doing that. Uh, and then Jomi says, uh, clamps are an artist's best friend. I can't tell you the comprehensive amount of like clamps and like stuff that holds other stuff together that I have in my studio. One day I'll do like, I keep saying like I'll do a studio tour. Like, my studio is not, it's not like an impressive place. I mean, or I don't know, I guess like I live in it, so I don't, I don't really see it. I think it's a really nice setup. I have like, I have like two versions of my studio. I have my, my live streaming studio, which is this, where I have like my Cintiq and I have a tabletop easel and I got my mic set up and I got my lights, and cameras. I can't say it's like a cockpit, like right here. It's like 180 degree, like half sphere of just equipment and gear and stuff. Uh, and then I have my like analog studio area, which nonetheless has to be really well lit, both for me, but also for the cameras there, has to have camera setups and stuff. So uh, it's conducive to working as well. Um, but that's like my general studio setup. But like so much of what I do is idiosyncratically developed because I have to do everything on camera. Like it's kind of my job. So if I can't do it on camera, like it's a, it's a problem. Uh, so I have probably like way more studio gear than anybody would need just to have a studio. And some of it's like so specifically suited to being on camera that that if you're not on camera, some of it just wouldn't make sense. But anyway, I don't know. This is probably totally uninteresting for everybody involved. Um, but Jami says, I like seeing other artists' hacks always interesting. There are some things, let me tell you right now, this is not gonna be a spoiler, but there are some things in my studio that I swear to you, if I'd have known about them like several years before I did, my life would have been so much easier. You know, bottom line is floor space is massively important, right? So you got to get your lights and rigs and stuff. You got to get it off of tripods. And I will, I will definitely show that because I feel like that's something everybody, everybody out there will benefit actually from some of this stuff. So I will, I'll do it. I'm, I'm committing now to doing it. Uh, I don't know how and what way I'm going to do it, but I'll, I'll figure it out. Emmanuel Alou says, should we try making creative looking backgrounds in tandem with a portrait? Yeah, well, I mean, depends on what you mean creative. I think that there is a great history of creative backgrounds all the way from, you know, the Mona Lisa to hundreds of years before that. Uh, and so absolutely, I do think so. However, studying environmental effects like with the model uh, is something that requires also like a very specific kind of subject matter. By the way, the drawing itself is coming to an end, but I'm just going to finish uh, answering this question real quick here. Uh, eventually, you need to study the model and interactions with light and depth to understand like what kind of backgrounds can fit around the model. If you just like chuck a background behind a model, what you're going to get is that like cut out clip art sense. Uh, that, that really is not what we're looking for. So model in an environment is probably something, like I said, requires requires some conversation, probably requires really like a good full lesson because most of what I do is about isolating the head because for, for students, it's also necessary to kind of learn a little bit in a vacuum at first. So that takes us to the end. I want to make some reminders to people. If you like the content here at all and you're watching and you think, hey, this guy told me where to get hats like that. I really appreciate it. Just hit the like button. That would do a great service for me. If you want to, to get onto the Atelier tier train and learn along with everybody else, October 1st, we've got advanced cast drawings starting out. The lesson notes and the paper toning video is going to come out uh, in the next few days, probably. And that's going to prepare us for the live stream that's going to take place on October 1st, advanced cast drawing. Um, if you want to learn all the rest of this stuff, there'll be a link in the description of this video, a link that'll pop up here. There's all sorts of ways to get to my Patreon page. 
it's very inexpensive, $10 a month, and you get hundreds of hours of content that's super focused and really interesting. Anyway, thank you people so much for bearing with me for a couple hours and uh, watching and for all your questions and stuff. And uh, yeah, take good care of yourselves. Listen, I will see you next Wednesday. Like I'm gonna be doing this again next Wednesday and every Wednesday for the foreseeable future. I'll be doing a live stream here on YouTube. So uh, check it out and I'll see you there. Bye everyone.